the Jobaria skeletons, they've got to copy every bone they've found. That's because they won't use the original bone in the mount. They'll use reproductions. Take the example of the long sought after and finally found skull. When they found it in the desert, it looked like this. After several months at the equivalent of a skull spa, it now looks like this. So the first thing we did is anytime we had one bone on one side and we're missing on the other side, I reflected it. So I was able to get this shape of this bone without a doubt because we had it on this side. We had this bone, but not this one. So I actually made this one in a hard plastic, an exact replica of this one. We had this one, but not this one. We had this one, but not that one. So I quickly reflected everything, and we were very fortunate in the field to get all of the major jaw bones on one side or the other. Is being laid to the surface, and he's going to brush it in so that it gets into all the, the detail of the bone. Six more layers of latex will follow until each of the hundreds of bones is covered with a thick latex sheath. Once the latex dries, they'll remove the hard exterior and begin to peel it off. While making molds is tedious, opening them up is tense, especially when it comes to something as complex as the skull. More than 40 hours of work have gone into this stage with little guarantee of success. This is the moment of truth as to whether the hard part will come out. Yeah. Because if it doesn't come out like that, then you can't open the mold. I leave. This is a success. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're very good. You're getting all the teeth, except that, that one's loose. But the most important thing is, is the mold, because that will allow you to pull out a single copy, a hard copy, that you can work with uh, in the final mount. But they're still vexed by a skull problem. When they were in the desert, they found parts of three different sized skulls. In the lab, they built a composite for only the smaller Jobaria they still need a much larger skull for the other skeleton. To solve this problem, they call Stephen Godfrey, a guy who spends a good part of his life in his basement making dinosaur bones. Godfrey will hand carve the bigger skull to the exact dimensions required. I know the length of the juvenile skull. I know I have to increase it by 25% to the size of the adult skull, scale it up. So there'll be an awful lot of foam that will be reduced, taken out of here, uh, to produce the finished product. Godfrey is a paleontologist and an artist. For the last several months, he has been busily carving a variety of bones, effectively recreating the missing parts of Jobaria in a fetching pink foam. As the skull evolves, Paul is about to confront a transforming experience of his own. It's called the Chicago Marathon. In his quest to raise sorely needed money to help pay for finishing the dinosaur, Paul is about to ruthlessly torture his skeleton by running a 26-mile course. Has Sereno finally bitten off more than he can chew? Now I realize what I got myself into. <laughs> so now I gotta run my butt off. <laughs> Paul is engaged in a race within the race. A group of 13 celebrity runners is competing for a cash prize, which the winner can use for their favorite cause. Paul is about to run for the bones. But the race has a bigger symbolic meaning, not just for Paul, but for anyone involved in the expedition and reconstruction. Sometimes it's difficult to understand all the steps involved in an expedition. And you think back to the dream years ago when 
We had no vehicles, we had no crew, we had no equipment, but I knew that there was a dinosaur out there waiting to be discovered. All the work and the tons of material collected, the, the hours spent cleaning, and then piecing together and pondering how we should put these things together. It's such a, a, a long amount of effort, it's very similar to a marathon. I see running the marathon as demonstrating to people uh, that this is not anything that is beyond our reach. We'll finish the marathon and we're going to construct this dinosaur. Perhaps Sereno is inspiring because of the scale of the things he tries to do. Running this race is a risk and he could fail, just like he could fail to build the dinosaurs on time. But he hasn't failed. Serino finished in three hours and 16 minutes, a surprisingly fast time for a first-time marathoner. I did it. Hi. I'm feeling fantastic. Couldn't feel better. I feel you got the I got the most I could ever get out of my bones. I ran that last mile for Chicago for the kids back there, and of course for the dinosaur. Congratulations, Bob. He placed third among the celebrity runners, but still high enough to win $7,500 for the dinosaurs. For Paul and his wife, Gabrielle, it's an incredibly satisfying moment. Even as he savors completing one marathon, Paul is closing in on the finish line of that other race. The last leg of the Bone Reconstruction Marathon is run here, in a kind of big tinker toy factory in Alberta, Canada. Led by paleo artist Gilles Denis, these unique craftsmen are masters at bringing the dead back to life. Each of the plastic bone copies has been attached to a giant steel armature and raised up in the form of two huge Jobaria skeletons. Paul is about to see them for the first time. It's actually, uh, it's quite big. We, uh, yeah, that, is a, that, is a, that is a beautiful curve you got on the tail there. Wow. Yeah, it's an, it really came out. You know, it's wow. one of the ones I'm most proud of. It really sweeps very elegantly. Wow, that is really beautiful. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you really caught a beautiful bit of movement there. That's really nice. Uh, he's the... Uh, do you look at the loose bones and you say, well, that's not that big. <laughs> you start putting right them together, they add up. You know, now it really, wow, that, that's, that's beautifully done. The capstone of this magnificent tower is the skull. Okay, we're going up. Whoa. <laughs> well, Jesse, wait till we get to 28 feet. It really wobbles. It's fitting that the part of the animal that gave them so much trouble from field to lab is the last piece of the puzzle to fit okay, into now place. Do this. Let me yeah. grab onto it this way. Yeah, okay. Like this. Attach that in there. Now, hang on. Keep a hold. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, let, let it go here. Well, we got wow. the skull on there. You want to go back down and take a look at it? Yeah. Well, let's do that then. It is an amazing pile of bones. The rearing Jobaria alone contains more than 250 different pieces weighs about 3,000 pounds and reaches a height of almost 28 feet. In the finest Sereno tradition, 
the skeleton is finished just before the deadline. About one week later, and two years after Paul and the team dug them up, the world meets the dinosaurs known as Jobaria. You ask yourself, how am I going to communicate some of this grandeur of past life to the public at large in a meaningful way, in a monumental way, in a permanent way? I think that's when you put these animals together and you try to express their significance in this fashion. And I look at these skeletons and I say, okay, we've done it. And now where do we go next? Wherever he goes next, he's bound to find yet another new animal, some creature that will force us to confront our planet's past. And that is a story of change, of the Earth in flux, and of animals so bizarre and so huge, we can only imagine and wonder. That's the skyline of Louisville. On this side of the city is the Ohio River. It's running pretty high right now, but this is just a trickle compared to what used to be here. About 400 million years ago in the Devonian age, this entire area was covered by a tropical sea. If you have any doubts, just look at the fossilized remains of some of those prehistoric sea creatures. Inside this rock is a 387 million year old snail. And this is a fossilized colonial coral head from the same period. Also in this area, you can find the remains of some of the mammals who came after the seas receded. This is the tooth of a woolly mammoth. It's a relative youngster, only about 12,000 years old. And now in some other parts of the world, there are new, rare fossil finds that are electrifying the scientific community. They're unhatched dinosaur eggs. On the outside, they look like ordinary rocks, but inside are actual dinosaur embryos. Up next on Explorer Journal, we're going on assignment with National Geographic photographer Luis Ahoyas. His beat is dinosaurs, his mission to crack the case for the prehistoric eggs. I've been photographing dinosaurs for about six years now, and I, I see it as sort of the very beginning of the legacy that I'm going to leave behind for the planet. That's definitely a passion. Nothing sort of gets me worked up like photographing these things and bringing them back to life. So it's like, to me, it's, I'm on a mission. I'm Luis Ahoyas, and I'm about to head out on a story for National Geographic magazine on dinosaur eggs and babies. And this is just the beginning. Usually when you're working with National Geographic, you have the luxury of an incredible amount of time to bring the story in. Uh, here, we need the pictures back in the office in about eight days. That means I have to go completely around the world at four countries, three continents, 24 time zones, and take seven masterpieces. Good question. I think it's 15. <laughs> it's a pretty impossible job, but I told them I could do it, so um, there's a lot riding on this week. Your, uh, I've got my assistant, John Canever. He's been with me for 15 years. He's the only person on the planet that I know that's crazy enough to come along with me. Around the world, okay. eight days. Good morning, the the this is Captain Terry Millen. How time did you change? Yeah, well, first officer Ray and he's arena and the entire flight crew. It's my pleasure to welcome you on board our flight this morning. Dinosaur eggs have been around for a long time, but for the first time, 
of seeing which dinosaurs belong to those eggs because now they're finding babies inside.